Okay. Well, good evening. Thank, Thank you for your time. <laughs> um, I, it's it's really delightful to see the different faces that God has brought out here, and the expression of your interest to be here. So anyway, I you know I've said this before. I think I say that it's start of every class, but I I view a class like this as a trust relationship because right. I mean it, you know I wouldn't. I wouldn't put out a certain amount of money and leave it on a table somewhere. Well, time is precious. I wouldn't just throw time at something unless I believed that it would benefit me. So um, your choice, you know, or just help us grow and that kind of thing. And your choice to give so much of your time this week is, is that's kind. So anyway, I'm looking forward to it. And I'm looking forward to the class as I've gotten to know Ken um, this is going to be a really beneficial class for me personally. So I'll try not to be too disturbing, taking notes over here on the side, I kind of tilted myself away. Um, it, I, there's going to be a lot to work through here. Uh, a bit about Ken and Vera. So they came up from uh, Vermont, just a couple of miles from the border. Um, actually, they just drove across and moved from Canada. So, um, and as far as history there, most of Ken's career was as a chaplain in the U.S. Army. So um, immense amount of investment of life there. What did you say? 30 plus years, 34 years. Some really interesting conversations we've already had about him navigating some of that. And the result of that is he has a lot of experience, both a lot of complex situations, uh, different groups and how to navigate that. Right in there, uh, a lot of knowledge about how to help people in the real world. So that's neat when you've got someone who has the, the extensive pastoral experience of working through um, difficult situations combined now with the academic chops. So just finished out a doctorate from Westminster, which is a very solid seminary. And he's also an author of a book in church history. I've listened to interviews from him that were very spirited, spirited, interesting interviews. He's being interviewed about his research and his work and those kinds of things. Um, and this is actually, I think, as I understood it, the fourth time he's taught this course. And he's got subsequent courses on the other periods of church history as well. So we're focusing in narrowly on that early part, which I think maybe gets neglected. We, we a lot of times hear about the Reformation or Reformation onwards, maybe the modern missionary era. And those, you know, those kind of get put front and center. But the fathers, uh, what would the first generation of Christians, the decisions they would need to make? I mean, this is really helpful. So I'm looking forward to it. Um, let me mention just a couple of orders of business, and then I want to get out of the way so that Ken will speak to us. Um, so we're in a new room. You can see that. Welcome. Hello. No problem at all. Oh, yes. For you guys, we have space. Um, so, yeah, we're in a new setting, a new room. And uh, that is different reasons, but the school is taking some different spaces. We're reconfiguring, but I'm pretty excited about the space. So just so you know, if you do end up taking a subsequent class, uh, we will probably be in here. Now, based on seating tonight, I might move us for tomorrow night just next door um, because, you know, we're maybe having a little trouble fitting in here. We'll see. But um, in any case, we'll be on the third floor for tomorrow night. Another thing I want to mention here, just so you, you know, and again, kind of for future reference, but if you're going to sign up for a class, uh, the one of the best ways that it just, I guess, helps us even to know uh, who to expect and that kind of thing. And it, then we have a record and make sure I can make sure you get any information if I'm going to email you. But if you come over to, hmm, I'm not sure why this screen is not sharing. Give me a second. I'll try to figure it out. Um, okay, there we go. Um, if you come over to foundationfoundistcollege.com, come to the website. And on there, you're going to go across to admission because you're joining something and hit apply now. So that's your your that's the window you're going to. And if you don't mind doing this, this would be a help. Then I kind of have a I have a record of um in a way to make sure I send you any information. And you'll sign up for a class right there. So website, Foundation Baptist College, come to admission, apply now, sign up for classes. It's a sh very short form. You would put your first name, last name, email, phone. This is so I can know whether to give you the Zoom link or, you know, just so I can make sure you're taken care of. 
And down here, you'll just choose your classes. So if you were taking this one for audit, you would click that, you would choose audit, and then and, and they, these are the other classes we're offering. So a student could just choose down what classes they want to take. Um, by the way, if you're wondering, here's the schedule for it. So if you, you know, you wondered about a class, that's your schedule. Uh, from down here, it's going to ask you one or two other questions. And this is if you've not taken one before, we do want to be aware of kind of, I guess the, the idea is uh, what, anyway, any other spiritual things that we can help you with. So if it's your first course, then it'll ask you a question or two about your salvation testimony. And that just gives me a little bit of understanding where you're coming from. Um, and then you'll hit submit. So that's the whole form. Uh, you just, I just basically filled it out right there. But if you're able, if you're interested in taking uh, this class or subsequent classes, this is a, this is the way that we sign up for classes. And what you did here is totally fine. Another alternative is show up. Um, and then I can help you walk through the form and that kind of thing. So any questions on that? That makes sense. What's that? .com? Yes, sir. Foundation Baptist College .com. Yes. Yes. Uh, when you fill it out, you'll immediately get an email. It'll confirm what you registered for. And, you know, it didn't come for you because I was still creating it. But you should get, uh, I mean, from here out, you'll get an email. What's that? <laughs> um, and then you'll it'll give you payment information. You can do e-transfer. Uh, you can do PayPal. You could you can bring cash or check in person if you want to do it. So it's kind of whatever method will work for you is great. But uh, e-transfer is always an option. So does that work? Good question. Anything else? Yes, sir. Is reach the same for this different Please, yeah. Uh, the way that this goes, we do offer classes for credit. And so that's towards a degree that's a little more expensive. If you're taking it for personal benefit, it's audit status. And that's $100 for the class. So, but um, totally what, what we've done all the way through is if someone wants to come sit in a first class, check it out, then the first night, no worries. So, yeah. yeah last night, I mean, yes, yeah. So, I'm glad you're here. Thanks for being here. No, and I'd, I'd be glad to uh, I'd be glad to chat and get to know you. So I don't think we've met before. Good, great, great. Okay, thanks. Thanks for being here. That's good. Good. Another question or yes, please. Uh, I don't remember, but I'll find it and bring it back to you. It's I have it, but I have to check it. Yeah. Good. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I'll open us in prayer and then please, uh, Ken, you can start us off. So, Father, thank you tonight for the yeah. privilege of us learning together, fellowshipping together, growing together in understanding your word and understanding history and understanding some of the influences that uh, even continue in so many ways to shape the way that we think today. So I pray that you would help us as we hear the testimonies and the lives of people that came before us to have an increased sense of the rich beauty of your gospel of the New Testament and of the history of how you worked in your people. And we look forward to what we'll learn this night and for the, the remainder of this week. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I got the QR code for this one. Great. Oh, great. Great. You got your camera? Uh, we're using the wrong. It'll. I can give it to you in a second. Okay. I have it on my phone. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm Ken Lawson, and my wife Vera is over here, and uh, I'm the uh, guest lecturer for the week for the course on uh, early church history. Uh, as um, 
Dr. Arnold mentioned a minute ago, this is the fourth time I think I've taught this course. And every time I go over the notes, I find them very refreshing. And I, I uh, crafted this course just for you tonight. And I hope that uh, we're gonna have a great time. As I think you know, it's um, Monday through Friday, seven to nine in the evening, and then Saturday morning for a few hours. Uh, but we can talk about that later. Uh, what I have now is a question for you. And the question is, why study early church history? I'm, I, I'm, I'm asking you, don't feel like you, just you, shut out. I mean, why? Is it church we need to know? Yeah, perfect. We need to know our roots. But why else? Why else do we study church history? Go ahead. Okay, yeah. Why is Christianity different in different parts of the world? Sure. Great. How about somebody else? What, what goes around comes around, goes around. Yeah. We can learn from the mistakes of people that went before us. Very good. I have a, a handout here for you. It's called, ready for this? Why study early church history? <laughs> See, is that original? <laughs> okay. So, give one to each of you and a few here. Now, we're going to go through this as a group. This is laying the foundation for everything we're going to do all week. So we'll take time to kind of go through this. Jared, did you get one? Okay. Um, I hope everybody got one or you can look on with someone. So. Okay. Why study early church history? Yeah. Beginning with the first Christians, we learn how God has been working internationally and cross-culturally in the lives of all his people for centuries. So the interesting thing is cross-culturally and internationally. The reason that I say that is, is that there's this myth that Christianity is somehow a European religion or a white person's religion. And that couldn't be any farther from the truth. Because Christianity started in Asia, and as we're going to talk about today, spread almost immediately into Africa and into countries that are today Syria, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Iran, and India. So from the first generation, when the 12 apostles that we're going to talk about in a minute, or later on tonight, when those 12 apostles went out into the world, as Jesus told them to go out into the world and preach the gospel to every creature, they did. And the places they went are fascinating. But it's not in the Bible. It's history. It's not scripture. So in scripture, we have who in the book of Acts, the main person going to from place to place to place. Who is that? Paul. The Apostle Paul. So we see him bringing the gospel from Jerusalem up towards what is today Lebanon and Syria and Turkey and then into Greece and, and eventually into Spain. And that's Europe. And that's Paul. But guess what? There were 11 other apostles. Where did they go? But we're going to learn about that. Where did they go? What they do? How did they suffer? Uh, how did they die? We have examples of that from church history. We're going to talk about that. If the accounts from early church history do not get your blood pumping, you had better evaluate your spiritual pulse. The early church provides a treasure of soul-stirring narratives. When we're going through this class, you may find yourself saying under your breath, they did that. They did that so we today can have what we have. That continues and says, uh, think of the heroic testimonies of men and women who took a daring stand for the gospel against destructive theological errors. Consider the faithful witness of the martyrs who died singing psalms and praising King Jesus as they were consumed I'm by the flames. Now, we'll so look at I can't really do questions. Next, not so much tonight, but the next nights what do you of mean? men and women who suffered and okay. died and were faithful to the faith. Well, the next paragraph says, serious, serious reflection of past theological struggles protects us from doctrinal error. That's important. I think one of you mentioned that when I said, why do we study church history? We Finish. don't want to repeat the mistakes done. of others. This reminds us of, of God's faithfulness, motivates us to persevere. The famous quote Sorry. is, those Finish. who don't know history Tell are going to repeat done. it. Why do we have to make the same mistakes over and over? Well, we don't if we know church history. It helps us to avoid errors 
oh, I remember that group did that years ago, and that was a mistake, and, and that was proven to be wrong. So why are we wrestling with that today? We should learn from history. Uh, okay, a second paragraph on the bottom. Furthermore, careful reflection upon historic religious movements warns us not to abandon biblical ministry for the manipulative methods, political acceptance, and quick numerical growth. The study of church history, therefore, preserves both orthodoxy. What does orthodoxy mean? Right doctrine. And here's a word you might not know. Orthopraxy. What does that mean? Right. So church ministry is not all about just what you believe or what you think. It's about what you do as well. Orthodoxy and orthopraxy. Knowledge of events from the past constructively informs our decisions in the present. It protects us from heresy and imprudence or doing things wrong or incorrectly or stupidly. Uh, lastly, to study early church history is to study God's enduring faithfulness. So we've been talking about names and, and movements and people and martyrs, but it's really a story about God and his providence working through people who are trying to be faithful. Christians must regularly reflect upon this truth in a world where there is increasing persecution of the church and the future seems uncertain. Like the psalmist, we must recount all of God's wonderful deeds. Psalm 9 and verse 1. Romans 15, 4 says, For whatever things were written before, including church history written before, whatever things were written before, we're going to make the application to this class, were written for our learning that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. And lastly, as it says on your sheet from 1 Corinthians 10, we have shows us the value of historical reflection, thinking about the past. It says in 1 Corinthians, now all these things happen to them as examples, and they were written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands Take heed lest you fall. We can learn from history, from the examples of others, to not repeat their mistakes. So that's essentially why we're studying early church history, to learn about heroes from the past, to learn about mistakes, villains and heroes, but also to learn about God and how God was working through his church over the early centuries. So this is where we're going tonight. Why study early church history? Well, we just talked about that. Uh, secondly, we'll discuss the first century European religious context. So let's just put ourselves back in the early church. Jesus has been crucified, buried, rose from the dead. He commissions his apostles to go out into the world and preach the gospel. In Acts chapter 1, the Holy Spirit comes down and empowers his, his followers gives them miraculous abilities. And Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2, and wham, out they go. And they start preaching in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the outermost parts of the earth. And as they're going out there, they're receiving opposition because of the culture, the people of the time, and then those first century apostles, and then their followers, and then their followers, and then their followers. We're going to look at the whole context of what it was like to be a Christian in the early church. That's the first century European religious context. And then it shoots out of Europe into those other regions that I discussed previously. And then finally, what I think is a fascinating question, whatever happened to the 12 apostles? We know about the apostles peanut butter and jelly first. because it's in the book of Acts and Peter's in there too. And we know about a little bit about say the apostle John because he wrote first John, second John, third John. I wrote Revelation. We know he was exiled to the island of Patmos because it tells us that in Revelation chapter one. So he was persecuted. He was exiled. But what about, you know, outside, the, please. they all went somewhere. Outside. He just told them to go and they went. So let's outside. talk about where they went. Outside, Joy. Where they out. went meant Not being churches gone. were starting. Christianity was Not growing in anywhere. parts of the world way outside of Europe. What I'd like to talk to you for the next few minutes is the first century of European um, the spread of Christianity in Europe. 
what we have here on the pitch on the screen here is a picture of a Christian martyr. We'll be talking about martyrs uh, throughout the week. Uh, this this person is a woman. Her name is Perpetua. We'll be talking about her a couple of times during the week. You can see that here is the body of a Christian who was uh, torn to death and eaten by lions. You can see the blood all over the pits here. This is a scene in the Roman Colosseum. This woman is looking up to heaven, uh, ready to be pounced on by this uh, creature. I don't know what it is, a lion or, or a cougar or I don't know, but whatever this is, it's going to rip her to shreds. And then in her last seconds, she's looking up to the Lord for help and for hope. This was very common in the early church. Um, just to, by way of a quick pop quiz question, can you name anyone in the New Testament, a follower of Jesus, that was killed for their faith? Stephen. Stephen is one. There's another one, too. His head was on a platter. John the Baptist is another one. All right. There, there's others, but at least one other. But um, this is what we're doing. We're going to talk about these people and these things, and particularly the context of the first century of uh, Christianity. So the first group that we're going to talk about is Judaism. These are the five groups we're going to talk about. Judaism, <clears throat> the Jewish people had a lot of freedoms under the Roman Empire. The synagogue life was uh, opposed to Roman idolatry, and the Romans tolerated that. The Jewish people, this was not a popular religion with Rome, it was, but it was tolerated. Some of the Romans were attracted to this one God of Judaism. For example, in Acts chapter 10, can you give me the name of a Roman soldier that was very drawn to Judaism? Cornelius, right, Acts chapter 10. There was also opposition to Christianity by Judaism. Uh, in Acts chapter 8, there was a man there who was uh, gathering the clothes and guarding the goods of people that were throwing stones at Stephen. His name was Saul, and it became the apostle Paul. Okay, so everybody, you're all tracking. Very good. So Judaism was one of the cultural religious issues facing the early church. Another one was pagan mystery religions. This is a little bit harder to define because in Judaism, you have the Old Testament. So obviously you have the rules and the precepts and the prophets and the priests. You have a text. But in the pagan mystery religions, it was much more based on sorcery, idolatry, the worship of spirits. And pagan mystery religions like this picture is here is trying to depict uh, he, this particular person is sort of a half human, half God. He's getting the snake. He's with the snake is whispering secrets into his ear for the mystery religion, as you can see here. Uh, some of these other animals, I'm not exactly sure what's going on. Uh, but this is a pagan mystery religion engraving, uh, which is depicting away. what was going on in much of the world, inside and outside the Roman Empire. A heavy dependence on animal sacrifices, some places human sacrifices. There were secret initiations and rituals by these uh, spiritually controlled priests uh, to share these secret mysteries. Uh, these a lot of these pagan mystery religions came out. You of guys will have to take care of dishes when you come back, or rather, you which will. Is a tongue twister to say and spell, but basically, it's a religion that came in. out of Persia and Asia, a pagan religion that was really heavy on reincarnation and worship of spirits and and multitudes of gods and goddesses. This this composed the pagan mystery religions outside of Rome. But Christianity was founded inside of Rome, inside the Roman Empire. And so that's the third point there on your notes. This Roman emperor worship, which was a, a uh, burden for the early church, it wasn't always in part of Roman culture. It developed slowly by, oh, around 45 or so BC, the Caesar of the Roman emperor, Empire, the emperor, he was granted divine titles and status by the Roman Senate. He was considered both a god and a king. This is around 40 or so BC. The Caesar was officially a god of the Roman Senate. His home was built as a temple, and his idol was placed in all Roman temples and corners of major streets. 
It was called a S O T E R, which is a Latin word for savior. This is really important to remember when the Roman emperors enforced the Christians to bow to their images because you would have an image of the Caesar's head. Let's just say it's this point, all right? So you have an, an image of the Caesar's head and underneath it, it says Soter, S-O-T-E-R, which means Savior. Savior. So you're a Christian. Your Savior is Jesus. There's none other Savior, no other name under heaven among men by which we can be saved. It's Jesus. And he says, okay, part of paying your taxes, you need to bow to this soter and burn incense or a candle or make a little offering to this. Are you going to do it? Some say yes. It's no big deal. It's an idol. It doesn't mean anything. Some say no. Because my only savior is Jesus and I'm loyal to him. Some didn't say yes or no. They left. They would depart the area, and when it was safe, they'd come back. We're going to have a whole discussion about that. As a matter of fact, I think I'll jump ahead on that. Okay. Let's say that we here, I'm guessing there's about, let's say there's 20 people in the room right now, all right? We are a house church, okay? I'm your pastor. We're meeting in an underground house church, and we're persecuted. Right down the middle here, this middle row, when persecution comes, and the Roman soldiers come on the door and they say, it's time to pay the tax and burn the incense to the emperor. This side of the room says, what's the big deal? It's only a statue. It doesn't mean anything. We'll do it. They're left alone. They're not persecuted. Um, the men aren't enslaved. The women aren't tattooed or branded. They're just left alone. But this side of the room, half, let's say the first couple of rows say, I'm out of here. And you leave. You leave town. You go flee to the mountains. You go to your cabin in the woods or whatever you do. And then the folks in the last two rows say, I'm a Christian. I'm not going to do that. If you persecute me, I don't care. Yeah. And so all of those three different ways, I'm going to deny, I'm going to flee, and I'm going to stay faithful. You all go your own way. Then the persecution stops. So we come back together. How are we all going to get along? One group burned incense to the idol. One group fled. And one group in the back stayed faithful. And now we're all back in our little house church again. Oh boy, what a mess. You weren't faithful. You left. You compromised. You ran away when it got tough. Now you want to be my friend again? Now you want to worship with me? When you, when you bowed the knee and burned the incense, and now you want to sit next to me and sing with me and pray with me? Do you want to have fellowship with me? Sound like a hypothetical situation? Uh-uh. Happened all the time. And in parts of the world, it could be and still is happening today in places where Christians are persecuted. That's an example of what it was like to be a first century Christian with Roman emperor worship because they were required at certain times in certain areas to bow the knee and burn the incense to that image of the soter. And remember what soter means? The savior, but Jesus is my savior. I'm not going to compromise, or am I? Important point in the early church. We're not just talking about theory here. This is real world stuff. Okay, next we have Greek philosophy. By the time of the early church, Greek philosophy had really passed its prime. The Roman system and the emperor system has sort of taken over Greek philosophy. And the writings of people, these names you're probably familiar with, the writings of Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, they really weren't relevant to the common people, really didn't apply to everyday life. There were conflicting theories on the meaning of life. In Acts chapter 17, it shows the attitude of the Greek philosophers in Athens. Can anybody just kind of tell me what was happening in Acts chapter 17, what Paul met with the people in Athens. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Just whatever comes to mind. Go ahead in the back. They were worshiping other, lots of other gods. Uh -huh. um, some philosophers, they didn't mind hearing Paul because it was a new idea to them. So right. they didn't that's it because they wanted new ideas. Right. And uh, they even had uh, a monument to the unknown god. Yeah. Know? 
Right. Yes. Yeah, that, that's a, that's yes. in a summary. Go ahead, elaborate. Yeah. 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 Talking and talking for the sake of talking to sound smart and Philip using philosophy to try to figure out things and everybody had the right answer. There was no wrong way. Yeah. And it was uh it was uh in Athens where that big school was where they debated that stuff. Well, Paul found in Acts chapter 17, when he goes there and he preaches about Jesus and the resurrection that Christ rose from the dead and belief and trust in him for salvation, how did the Greek philosophers respond? Anybody remember? Yeah, some said basically <laughs> you're nuts. Others said, I think the line is, we'll hear you again on this matter, which basically means, yeah, we like to talk, so we'll talk some more about it, but we're really not really not that interested probably. And so that's that's kind of where Greek philosophy is and and in some ways we uh in the, in the u.s where i'm from and here in canada a lot of that is our culture today and the school the universities especially there's no right and there's no wrong you just debate ideas and things and whatever works for you is fine but that doesn't jive with that doesn't coordinate with one who rose from the dead who said i am the way the truth and the life no one comes unto the father except by me and so there's a huge cultural clash not only back <laughs> with the Greeks. point Right. 17. Paul is there defending the faith and reasoning with the people about mm -hmm. Christianity sure. and about Jesus and the resurrection. Yep. Death and the cross. Mm -hmm. That's what really I think I think Acts 17. Have you apologetic Great. But anyway, whatever and, everybody and, else wants to say. And, 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 and as a result of that, how did the people respond to that message that he preached? Like you well, said. I agree with what he said. They all went and wanted to talk more about yeah. it. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. Okay. So lastly, on this slide, we have Gnosticism. Anybody heard that word before? Yeah, okay, a few of you. Um, the Gnosticism is, again, like some of the pagan mystery religions, is a little bit hard to, to really codify because it's sort of um, squishy. I don't know theologically how to say that. It's hard to grab it because it, it's, it just always seems to be changing or it's very mystical and there's no code or doctrine says this is Gnosticism. This is the handbook for Gnosticism. There was nothing like that, but it was based on um, the forces of good or light battling the forces of evil or darkness. Uh, in uh, Oriental religion, you might call it the yin and the yang principle. Uh, the physical world was evil. It was dark. It was an illusion. The true world is, ach is achieved by inner secret knowledge. So the Gnostics would say, for example, that Jesus did not have a physical body. He could not have a physical body. He definitely did not rise physically from the dead because physical matter is evil. evil. Yeah. Correct. Salvation was through knowledge. It was through secrets. It was through mysteries. It was through initiations and such things. And the Apostle Paul, he confronts this in a lot of the books, the Colossians, Chapter 2, verses 4 through 10 speaks about this specifically. It talks about not getting involved in mysteries or worshiping of angels or, or these kind of speculative things, but to focus on Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. Okay, any questions on this particular slide? Okay. Yes, please. I guess you're going to get into it. Go ahead. Um, ways of organizing churches or developing at this point, too, based yep. on the model state. Uh huh. Uh huh. And that was, that's, uh, you know, churches went one way, the other way, they had groups of bishops or other churches. Too, so. <laughs> You've been peeking at the syllabus, haven't well, you? Because yeah, well, I... <laughs> we're going there. The curious focus. We're going there. That, you, by the middle of this week, you'll have the answer to that. Okay, here are three important terms uh, that um, we're going to be discussing. We generally talked about these in the last slide when we talked about the five, um, the five different obstacles to the culture of the day. So these terms are pantheism, polytheism, and henotheism. And so I'm hoping that the text is enough so that you could read this, but each one of these three words has the same suffix. Theism, see, pantheism, polytheism, 
Aquino theism. So what is theism? You have to know that first before you can know what the three prefaces is. And so up in the top here, it says theism is a belief in the existence of a God, especially belief in one God as creator of the universe, intervening in it and sustaining a personal relationship to his creatures. So are you a theist this evening? I am. I believe in one God who interacts with the world, a creator God who is not distant and foreign, but intercedes in our lives. I believe in that. I'm a theist. But what's a pantheist or pantheism? Mm -hmm. Well, pan comes from the word nature, meaning the physical world. Pantheism believes that God or gods are part of the physical world. Pantheism is the philosophical religious belief that the universe is identical to divinity or supreme being. In other words, you're sitting on a chair right now. If you were really a pantheist, you'd have to say, I'm sitting on a God. You'd have to say that. You'd have to concede mm. that that was true because you're sitting on something that's physical. And pantheism believes that all things have some sort of a connection or relationship to God. The physical universe is thus understood as a God or the God still expanding, still creating, which has existed since the beginning of time, but not a person, not a personal being. It's a thing. It's an entity. It's an ever moving, ever evolving, ever forming kind of thing called pantheism. Okay. The next key term is polytheism. Again, you have the word theism in there and poly is many or more than one. So someone who is a polytheist or believes in polytheism believes there are many gods and goddesses of various ranks that form a hierarchy of spiritual beings that can assist or humiliate humanity. A classic example of polytheism is Greece and Rome, ancient Greece and ancient Rome, where they had a hierarchy of gods. Zeus was the main god. And then you had like Mars, the god of war, and you had Saturn, who was another god. And you had hundreds and hundreds of gods and goddesses that there were temples to all over the place. That's polytheism. And then the last one here, which maybe is a word you hadn't heard before, is henotheism. And henotheism is essentially meaning you believe in one god above other gods. It's like you have a favorite one. So it's not exactly like polytheism. And it's not really like pantheism, but it kind of has some similarities. But Hino comes from the Greek word uh, or the number one, uh, specifically one above others in this context. Hino theists believe that a single god or goddess is central above other gods. Hino theists worship one spiritual being as superior and worship other beings as lesser deities. Today, uh, a religion that does that is uh, Hinduism. Hinduism believes in hundreds or thousands. I have a friend who's from India, and he said, in fact, there's probably 300 million gods and goddesses in Hinduism. And each village or each community or each tribe or each chief of each tribe would have one particular one that was like the, the um, god that, worship, that they worship for that village or that community or the individual god, but the other gods and goddesses are also part of that. But they would be a henotheistic village or a henotheistic person one God worship above others, not one God solitary. That's called what? That's not on the screen. What is one God solitary? That's all I believe in, one God. Monotheism, that's obviously one God. Well, because we have pantheism, polytheism, and henotheism facing Christians in the early church, I like this quote that's here from 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 4 through 6. It says, Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, and you take idol pantheism idols, polytheism idols, or henotheism idols, it doesn't matter what kind. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other God but one. But this is the culture the early church is facing. But Paul is saying pantheism, polytheism, henotheism is not right. There's one God. And he continues. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us, here it comes again, for, for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ. So he's seeing Jesus Christ as God as one, 
They're not two gods or one higher and lower God. They're one God. God the Father and Jesus Christ, he's saying, are equal, of whom are all things, and we for him and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we live. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. That's why we have the mission field in the early church of pantheism and polytheism and henotheism and seeing men and women saved out of these three movements and coming to faith in Christ. So I think that's pretty exciting. So these are three terms that we need to be familiar with when we realize what the early church is facing. All right, um, if you have a Bible, it might be helpful to go to Acts chapter two. Uh, and we're gonna look at a, some particular verses here that speak about this geographic region. Then we'll take a stretch break. If you don't have a, a Bible, we can just follow along as best you can. In Acts chapter 2, as I mentioned earlier, the early church is just starting. Jesus has <laughs> resurrected. He sent the Holy Spirit. In, in Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, it's the day of Pentecost. People are all gathered at one place in Jerusalem. These miraculous events are happening that are empowering the early church, uh, whether it's um, the Holy Spirit coming down, people speaking in different languages. Um, people are amazed and astonished. In verse eight, it says, and how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? So let's just do a quick um, illustration. How many people in here speak a language outside of English? Raise your hand. One, two, maybe four or five. Okay. So. Uh, my wife's second language is Spanish. How about uh, you who raised your hand? What's your second language? French. French and Creole. French and Creole. Spanish. Spanish, okay, in the back? Uh, French. French? Okay. I think I counted five different languages. That's pretty neat, isn't it? Yeah, five different languages. Okay, so what would it be like if all of a sudden there was a bright flash of light, there was a rush, sound of a rushing wind, and I'm speaking to you now, and you're hearing me in Creole. You're hearing me in Spanish. You're hearing me in Spanish. You're hearing me in French. And I, did you say Filipino? Tagalog is, and, you're, and so I'm talking, but five languages are being heard. All right, that's wild. All right, but it's much more than five languages. So let's continue. We're in Acts chapter two, beginning in verse eight. And how is it that we each hear them in our own language, which, we were born. So here are some of the people groups. It says Parthians and Medes and Elamites and Mesopotamia. And you, I, I just from simplicity in my own head, I said, I broke these down in four groups. These are groups to the East. This would be today, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, uh, those Syria, that region here. And then it continues uh, in verse nine. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia. Then it says Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia. So this is kind of to the Northeast. This would be today, Lebanon, Syria, Turkey. Then it says the next, the next group in uh, verse 10. Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene. So this talks about Phrygia and Pamphylia, again, that's, that's basically where Turkey is today. And then it goes to these up, this other group, Egypt, Libyans, was, Libya is Libya, it's been the same name for millenniums, Rome, Cretans, that's an island in the Mediterranean, Arabians, which is probably kind of by Jordan today, maybe where Jordan and the nation of Saudi Arabia is. Basically, what is, what is this telling us? Is that the early church went boom, after Acts chapter two. And all of these people have their own language, their own culture. All of these individuals in some way are consumed in these three areas, whether it's pantheism, polytheism, or henotheism. All of these groups are now gonna have a Christian witness to them. At this event, this feast in Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came and the Jewish people heard about Christ, 
Jewish people from many nations in all directions heard about the resurrected Jesus and witnessed miracles performed by the apostles. Some of these people returned to their home countries as Christians. Others were ready to listen when the apostles and others later came to their lands to preach Jesus. So all of these places that are on the screen here are places that the first, second, third generations of, of followers of Jesus went. They went to these places. And we're going to talk about what it was like to be a Christian in these areas. Unfortunately, and I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but that's okay. Um, a lot of these records, a lot of these early accounts of Christians were destroyed by a movement that came through that area in the 500s and 600s and murdered Christians, raped Christian women, tortured Christian men, destroyed Christian buildings, eradicated the scriptures, and set up their own temples and their own religion. And what would that be? Islam. And so a lot of these, these um, records from these groups, especially the first three, uh, more than the first three, their records are destroyed. So what we have as we study church history is not necessarily the records, I'll just pick one out. Um, let's say uh, the Elamites who are from um, what would be today Iraq and Syria, thoroughly Muslim part of the world. Well, their records were all destroyed, but what we do have are other groups like Christians in Crete talking about the Elamites or Christians in Egypt talking about how the Elamites were persecuted. So we have records, but they're not their own records because they were destroyed, but we have accounts of what was happening. And that's what we're gonna talk about for the next several nights. Okay. any? Questions, comments on anything so far? Okay. Um, take it. Okay. I'm going to jump ahead. Uh, talk about uh, the execution of Christian and Christianity. Yep. Um, they also talk about the Christian were the one that executed him, right? Uh, so, what, when is this in time? The Christian being persecuted versus us turning and then that's when. I think the Catholicism or something like that mm -hmm. becomes the religion of the government or something like that. Yes, that is many centuries after this. That That is a class that uh, could be taught in the future. And basically, you're right on because there was a time when Christians, believers, people who had the Lord Jesus in their heart, had a new life, a new birth, a new beginning, and wanted to get together and sing and pray and praise and fellowship and witness. When people like that, people like me, people like us were persecuted, but then it, it changed when Christianity became a state religion. We're talking about the last class of today, so uh, uh, for Saturday morning or Friday night, maybe. But when it all changed and it became convenient and acceptable to become a Christian, and then the government got involved, all of a sudden the government that claimed to be Christian was persecuting people who were different. And that's when total corruption came into Christianity. And um, that's another class. Which we'll talk about at the end of this class, but it really got poisonous towards the, after the end of what we're talking about up until the early 300s. Because I found like a lot of times before that they can say, oh no, we were the ones who persecuted people mm -hmm. to become Christian. Mm -hmm. Found that the misunderstanding there. Yes. Uh huh. What we do, Sam, we've been persecuted. Right, right. Yeah. More to come on that. Okay. Ready for a stretch break, everyone? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, come back at uh, 10 minutes, please. <laughs> Thank you. I see it in 325. We will examine the writings and histories of those who knew Jesus' disciples. So we're not only going to talk about these people, we're going to look at their writings. So you're going to be able to read something that was written by someone who the Apostle John <laughs> taught. And you can read what he said, what he believed, John, others. Mm -hmm. We'll discuss the lives of the heroes and the villains in the early church. Persecution and martyrdom, we'll be talking about that. The international spread of Christianity. Uh, why we believe and practice today has a foundation back from the apostles in those first centuries. The textbooks are there uh, that uh, are, we'll be referring to these textbooks all the time in the class. Uh, but thanks to Dr. Arnold, he has two of those three digitally for you. Uh, how he gets that to you, I have no idea. 
but he <laughs> saved you a whole bunch of money because you didn't have to buy it. And if you bought it, I'm glad you bought it because um, these are books that you're going you're to have in your library for a long time. They're not just quick read books and then you give them away. These are things that will be in your religious theological library for your life. They're, they're, they're timeless books. Yeah. And, and so the three of them are there. Uh, we'll be discussing them uh, throughout the class. I think maybe one chart, yeah, one chart, one of these charts today. The daily schedule is there. Because it's a condensed course, it's expected that you're on time and that you attend. And if you miss a class, uh, it will be recorded uh, by Dr. Arnold. And again, you can talk to him about how to get that class that you miss. Uh, okay, class number one at the bottom, which is where we are today. We're over halfway through that class. And if you turn over, you have tomorrow night, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday mornings class. For those of you who are taking the class for credit, there is a final project uh, and don't get all worked up about it. It's not a big deal, but it's basically uh, some topic. Well, first of all, before I can finish that sentence, how many of you are taking the class for credit? One. Okay, we'll talk after. Okay. This, you do, maybe you too? Okay. There's also one online. Okay. All right. Well, the final project is a seven page paper, but that's not seven page of text. That's a cover page. Then that's a bibliography. So it's five pages of actual typing. Okay. And, it, and it's there, whatever the academic policies of the school are, as far as font and spacing, and if, even if you, if you have that to that detail, those policies all apply. So that'd be on the website or talk to Dr. Arnold about that. Okay, we will be having a quiz every week, including tonight. Uh, they're very simple, basically real like, what did you learn tonight? Or what was the most important thing you remember from the class? Those kinds of things. But every night is a quiz. So when I do the final grade for the two that are taking for credit or however many on a line two, then I will have at least five quizzes at a final project to grade. And for those of you who are uh, taking the class for audit or don't know if you're gonna take it for credit or audit, I still welcome you to take the quiz at the end of the course. It basically is a summary for your own mind. Just what did I learn tonight? What did I just listen to that guy for two hours for? What did I get out of that? Okay. Any questions on the syllabus? All right, well then. <laughs> Whatever happened to the 12 apostles? How many apostles do you know what happened to them from prior experience or things you've heard or read? What happened to, to these? <laughs> they all died. They all died. Who got that A? <laughs> they all died. Okay. But they um, didn't stay dead. They didn't stay dead. That's right. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, right? Okay, so we're going to look at these individuals. Here they are. And uh, the Apostle Paul is not mentioned there because he was not one of the 12, but we are going to talk about him. Uh, Judas was one of the 12. He was re replaced by Matthias. So that's why Judas is not here and Matthias is there. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about where these guys went for ministry and what we know about how they ministered, how they served. Um, you don't have to um, copy everything I'm saying down about this because uh, you don't have, they don't have that, do they? I have the chart on the board, on the screen, but they don't have it. Okay. Uh, I can get you that easily, but for you who have the textbook tonight, it's chart number 10. So and all the charts are in here. This is really, really helpful book. Okay, so let's talk about these guys. We'll start with Peter. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 5 that Peter was ministering to Jews in Babylon. Now, some people say, well, what Babylon was that? Some people say that's a code word for, the, for Rome. Uh, I don't think so. I think it's Babylon is Babylon um, in what would be Mesopotamia or Iraq or Iraq area. Uh, I think that's true because there was a large Jewish population there. And when um, we talked about in Acts chapter two earlier this evening about when the Jews dispersed, 
after Pentecost, many of them went to Babylon and were Christians or were Jewish people who had heard the gospel. And Peter went to them and followed up with them from Pentecost. That's what the early church fathers believed, that Babylon was Babylon. It was not the big Babylon from Assyria back that we read about in the Old Testament, but it was still there. There was still a Jewish community there. It was part of what would later be called the Silk Road. Anybody heard that expression before? The Silk Road that would go from Europe to China and uh, goods were traded along there. Well, Babylon was a stop. So I think Peter was in Babylon. Uh, early church records say he was martyred by Nero in uh, the year 64. And um, we'll have a, a picture of a uh, painting of this coming in a few minutes and uh, an account from the early church. The next person there is Andrew. His uh, ministry area would be in today, one of the regions north of Greece. Um, today, the countries would be Bosnia, Kosovo, Macedonia, uh, the Czech Republic, Romania, up in that general area. Uh, he was uh, crucified at a city called Patras uh, in uh, the year 62, we believe. Not exactly sure about that. Uh, the next person there is James. Uh, he was martyred by Herod. This is in Acts chapter 12. It's in the scriptures. Um, the next person is John. The last apostle called the elder in 2 John and 3 John. Church history tells us he ministered in Ephesus. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9 says he was exiled to the island of Patmos. We don't, he may have been the only one of the 12 that did not die a violent death. He, the church history is silent on that. Uh, he may have just died of old age in exile. We don't know. Philip ministered in Asia Minor, which is uh, Turkey today. He was crucified in a village or a city called Hierapolis in Western Turkey. Uh, Matthew um, he was in the Eastern Roman Empire, <clears throat> then went down to uh, south of Egypt to Ethiopia. And then uh, some accounts have him in Persia also, but the, the most Reliable accounts have him going down the Nile River past Egypt into Ethiopia and uh, ministering to the first generation of Christians, which is Matthew, to the second generation of Christians, and he's in Africa. How many of you knew that? You know, a lot of people think Christianity is a, is a European or a, a white person's religion. It is absolutely not true. From the very earliest time, Jesus, who was not a white man, he was a Jew, and his disciples were Jews, and they ministered, as the book of Acts says, up towards Europe, where a lot of our ethnic background is from. Mine's from Denmark and Portugal. But at the same time, as I'm telling you, these people, they're going to Africa, and they're going out towards, even Thomas was in India. We'll talk about him a lot next week. It's a fascinating account. Okay, but I, I digress there a little bit. Uh, we're at Thomas. Uh, Thomas, as I just mentioned. How did Matthew die? Maybe. Uh, do we know? Oh, uh, no. It says uncertain. Uncertain how Matthew died. Thomas uh, was in India, spent his entire adult life after the Great Commission from Jesus, was in India. We have lots and lots of records in India uh, from the go from the 150, 175, uh, maybe the year 200 or so. Lots of records about Christianity in India from Thomas fascinating stuff uh, that a lot of church history classes don't talk about. A lot of church, we had this conversation the other night with Dr. Arnold and I, a lot of, Christ, a lot of uh, church history classes are all Eurocentric, meaning you're focusing on Europe and church history in Europe. Yeah, there's church history in Europe, but at the same time, there's church history in Asia and India and Africa and other places. And let's talk about that because Christianity is a world religion. Okay, um, I mentioned Thomas. Uh, Bartholomew, uh, he was in Armenia, which if you can picture in your mind between the Black Sea, I wish I had a map in here, Joel, uh, which is between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, if you can picture that, or if you want to cheat and look at the back of your Bible at a map uh, where you can see the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, it's right up in that area where the territory of Georgia, which was part of the old Soviet Union is, okay. Uh, James, uh, son of Alpheus, who's mentioned as one of the 12, 
We don't know. A lot of accounts say Syria with a question mark. We don't know much about his ministry, about how he died. Thaddeus, absolutely fascinating person. Thaddeus is one of the 12 uh, who had perhaps one of the most significant ministries of all the 12, and most people have never even heard of him. Uh, his ministry was in a place called Edessa, E-D-E-S-S-A. -S -S We're going to talk a lot about Edessa. Edessa was the headquarters outside the Roman Empire for Christianity to head east. Eventually, it would reach China, but that's, that's a, a class later than this one. But Edessa was a missionary station east, not in the Roman Empire, Asians ministering to Asians, reaching out into Persia, Afghanistan, um, Iraq, uh, Iran, those places. We'll talk about him in, throughout the week. Uh, then the next one is Simon. Uh, North Africa is all we know, Egypt, Carthage, but we don't have much on him. And uh, Matthias, who was the one who replaced Judas, he was in Egypt and in Ethiopia. He would die by stoning uh, at, in the year 80. He was stoned to death. The way that they would do that in, in um, Bible days is two ways. One, if they were merciful, they would take the person, lay him down, or her down and take a large stone and just crush their skull. And then others in the village would come and just throw rocks at the body until it was covered. That would be the, the humane way. The inhumane way was to stone the person while they were still alive. And so the person would be dodging stones and getting hit and hit and then finally get to their knees and still, then they'd be, the person would be like this and the stones are coming and banging, breaking bones and bleeding profusely. And, and then the person would eventually die a slow, horrible death. Uh, Matthias died of stoning in the year 80, uh, and this was between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. So this is a little bit of an example of what the apostles went through after Jesus said go, and they went obediently, and all of them died in ministry, perhaps with the exception of the Apostle John. So everything I just told you is also on a chart, which is in the book of charts, but um, I'm going to go. This is the first half of it. It extends down there, but that's another slide. So if you want to take a picture of that and save your writing or, or whatever, but uh, I'm not going to read this necessarily, but uh, the biblical information, Peter's preaching at the day of Pentecost, all these things are in the book of Acts here. And then he wrote 1 Peter and 2 Peter. Um, late traditions speak of him visiting Great Britain and Gaul. Gaul is the old word for France. I'm not sure how much of that is true, uh, but we do know that he was crucified upside down during Emperor Nero's persecutions. Um, Andrew is mentioned here. There's not a whole lot of information about Andrew in the New Testament, except that he was a follower of Jesus, one of the 12 who was listening and learning, and the areas where he was ministering. Uh, James, the son of Zebedee, was that, that's in the book of Acts when he was killed. John. I mentioned as probably the one who died a natural death. Um, here's some of the biblical information on him. Wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelation, which is here called the Apocalypse. We know he ministered in Ephesus. He was uh, defending the early church related to Gnosticism. Ah, there's a word you remember from the first part of the class, right? What's Gnosticism without looking at your notes? What basically just give me a, what is it's uh what? Physical is yep. sinful and spiritual. Right. And so when you read first John, second John, and third John, a lot of scholars are saying those letters are written against Gnosticism because he's saying in those letters, Jesus is physical. Him we him, how does it say in the beginning? Him whom our eyes have seen and our hands have touched. You know, he's talking about the physicality of Jesus against the Gnostics. And here it says he died a natural death in Ephesus. If that's true, then somehow he got off the Isle of Patmos. But I don't know. You know one of the things you'll find me saying a lot is I don't know because there's no records. And so I mentioned earlier that a lot of those were wiped out by the Muslims. If I don't know, I'll say I don't know. Uh, I'm, I'm fine with that. Uh, as it gets closer to current time, we know more, we have more facts. Here's the bottom part of that slide.
Philip, uh, not a whole lot of biblical information. Matthew, uh, we talked about where he ministered. Uh, Ethiopia is mentioned here, of course, and some other places perhaps, but the Ethiopian tradition is very strong. Thomas is fascinating. Um, India, Bartholomew we mentioned earliest. Uh, here's Thaddeus, and you'll be getting very familiar with this city by the end of the week. You will think of Edessa. If you, maybe you've never heard of the name before, but that will that the name of that city will mean something to you uh, very soon. Um, Judas hanged himself. Here's about Paul. We know about Paul from the Book of Acts and his letters, uh, Romans and Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Thought to have been freed from the first Roman imprisonment that would have been in the Book of Acts. And then traveled to Gaul and Spain. There's a very early tradition from the early hundreds that says the Apostle Paul was in Spain. I personally think that that's true. It says in the book of Acts or no Romans, he says, I want to come to see you soon. Or so quickly, I think it says. And he's speaking about wanting to go to Spain to visit. Does anybody remember where that text is? I'm trying to remember off the top of my head. I can't remember. It's Romans 15. It's I mean, like 16, but it's 16. Romans 15 or 16 at the end. Right. At the end of Romans, he says, I want to come and see you soon. And he's talking to the Romans. And then it tells us in church history that he did go there. Um, he was beheaded in Rome under Nero. Uh, and the dates there are for you. So this is just a quick summary of where the uh, 12 went and what they did. So having looked at that quickly, now we're going to kind of do a deep dive into a few of them and look at the accounts of their death from church history. Okay. Here is a medieval period painting of the martyrdom of the apostle Peter. Early church records say that he was crucified upside down. And so this artist is trying to depict that of Peter being crucified upside down. An account of his... Um, martyrdom is in Fox's Book of Martyrs, which was copied from early church history sources. I, I was hoping that you would all have Fox's Book of Martyrs tonight, but I think it's just a couple of us that do. So Dr. Arnold, in his really cool, snazzy, high-tech abilities, <laughs> he was able to find it and print out what I, what's in the book. So let's go to the next page and read this. This is the account from the early church that was copied down by John Fox in Fox's Book of Martyrs. Uh, among many other saints, the blessed apostle Peter was condemned to death and crucified, as some do write, at Rome, albeit some others, and not without cause, do doubt thereof. Pegasippus, maybe, is how you say that? Pegasippus saith that Nero sought matter against Peter to put him to death which when the people perceived, they entreated Peter with much ado that he would fly the city. Get out of Rome, Peter. Nero's after you. But Peter, through their importunity, at length persuaded him. It's like the old English is kind of clumsy. In other words, Peter wasn't listening to the people. Uh, Peter prepared himself to avoid. But coming to the gate, he saw the Lord Christ come to meet him, to whom he worshiping said, Lord, whither? Goest whither, Lord, whither dost thou go? I'm sure, he didn't say it that way in old English. <laughs> to whom he answered and said, I am come again to be crucified. By this, Peter, perceiving his suffering to be understood, Peter returned to the city. Jerome said that one of the church, early church history fathers said that he was crucified, his head being down and his feet upward, himself so requiring because he was, he said, unworthy to be crucified after the same form and manner as the Lord was. So this is an account from Peter, from, uh, talking about Peter's um, death, his martyrdom, being crucified upside down from early church fathers, being narrated by Fox, who gathered all of these accounts and put them in this book called Fox's Book of Martyrs. It's a little bit awkward to read, but... Um, I wanted you to see that because that's an account of people who saw Peter and knew of Peter, how he died. Okay. So next we have Andrew. This is a medieval period painting long after Andrew lived. A medieval period painting of the martyrdom of the apostle Andrew. 
Early church <laughs> records say he was crucified in an X style cross. And so thanks to Dr. Arnold, we have an extended account from Fox's <laughs> Book of Martyrs of Andrew the Apostle's death. So to save my voice, I would like to have some of you read in the in the class, okay? So um, maybe some of you don't like to read out loud. So I'll just say, somebody from the back row, you guys can arm wrestle or whatever, but could one of you read this paragraph, please? <laughs> nice and loud. Of Andrew, the apostle and brother to Peter, thus Christ to you all. Andrew did preach in the year four score of our Lord Jesus Christ to the Scythians and Sophians, to the Sais, and in a city which is called Sebastopolis, where the Ethiopians do now inhabit. He was buried in Patra, the city of Achaia, and crucified by Dias, the governor of the Edessenes. Bernard and St. Cyprian do make mention of the confession and martyrdom of this blessed apostle. For uh, partly out of these, partly out of other credible writers, we have collected after this measure. Okay. Next, please. Next row. Anyone from the next row, please, that would like to read? This is all still about Andrew. When Andrew, through his diligent preaching, had brought many to the faith of Christ, Gaius, governor, knowing this, resorted to Patrick's. With the intent he might constrain as many as did believe Christ and God, but the whole consent of the Senate to do sacrifice unto the idols and so give divine honor unto them. Andrew, thinking good, beginning to resist the wicked counsel and the doings of chaos, went unto him, saying to this effect unto him, that it behooved him who is judge of men first to know his judge which dwelleth in heaven, then to worship him being known, and so in worshiping the true God, to revoke his mind from false gods and blind idols. These words spake Andrew to the proconsul. But Egeus, greatly therewith discontented, demanded of him whether he was the same Andrew that did overthrow the temple of the gods and persuade men to be of that superstitious sect which the Romans of late had commanded to be abolished and rejected. Next row, someone please, maybe the pretty girl in green. <laughs> Andrew did plainly affirm that the princes of the Romans did not understand the truth and that the son of God coming from heaven into the world for man's sake had taught and declared how those idols whom they so honored as gods were not only not gods, but also most cruel devils, enemies to mankind, teaching the people nothing else but that wherewith God is offended, and being offended, turneth away and regardeth them not. And so by the wicked service of the devil, they do fall headlong into all wickedness, and after their departing, nothing remaineth unto them but their evil deeds. But the proconsul charged and commanded Andrew not to teach and preach such things anymore. Or if he did, he should be fastened to the cross with all speed. And lastly, front row, someone please. Good <laughs> Andrew, abiding his former mind, very constant, answered thus concerning the punishment which he threatened. He would not have preached the honor and glory of the cross if he had feared the death of the cross. Whereupon sentence of condemnation was pronounced that Andrew teaching and enterprising a new sect and taking away the religion of their gods ought to be crucified. Andrew going toward the place and seeing afar off the cross prepared did change neither countenance nor color Neither did his blood shrink, neither did he fail in his speech, his body fainted not, neither was his mind molested, nor did his understanding fail him, as it is the manner of men to do. But out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth did speak, 
and in fervent charity did appear in his words as kindled sparks. He said, O cross, most welcome and long look for, with a willing mind, joyfully and desirously, I come to thee, being the scholar of him, which did hang on thee, because I have always been thy lover and have coveted to embrace thee. Well, these are words that are attributed to Andrew as he's on his way to be crucified upside down. If you read this and this doesn't stir you, I don't know what will. Here's a man faithful to death, approaching the cross and still loyal to Jesus and suffered a miserable and horrible death. And the early church speaks of these men in such a complimentary way. The next person to look at is Thomas. Early church records state that the apostle Thomas was killed by Hindu priests in India. This particular sketch is dated around the year 1000. And if I remember right, I believe the accounts say that he was, I think the word is poked or pierced or something like that. Um, but we'll look at it in a minute. But I like the, the, the way that the artist depicted this person. You can see that and the apostle Thomas is in the middle. Uh, he's dressed in European type robes, uh, the kind of robes that a traveling preacher, a traveling teacher uh, would use. Uh, the two Hindu people around him uh, are represented in Hindu clothing, uh, Hindu colorings, and Hindu spears. And if you look carefully, this particular character on the far left is poking Thomas in the side, and this one is about to stab him probably in the heart. The account that's in Fox's Book of Martyrs is very brief. I think it's only three, three lines, maybe. But in the next, I think it's next week's class, we're going to talk a lot about Thomas because there are lots and lots of records of his ministry in India and his death. But let's just look at what Fox's Book of Martyrs says about his death. It says, Thomas preached to the Parthians, Medes, and Persians, also to the Parmanthians, Hyrensians, Bactrians, and Magians. These are all tribal people that are between Europe and India. Again, what would be Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran, those types of people. So he's preaching in a certain direction to go to a certain place, which is ultimately India. So he's preaching along the way. It says he suffered a, in Kalamina, a city of India, being slain with a dart. Okay, that's the word I was trying to, some kind of a puncture. He was slain with a, like a spear or a dart that jabbed him. I have been to India twice uh, on mission trips. And um, the Indian people, the evangelical Bible-believing, truly saved people in India. Not the state church, but the, the, the real uh, Bible-believing folks as well as the state churches, all trace their roots to Thomas. It's, a, it's, a, it's as common as saying that um, George Washington was the first president of the United States. I mean, everybody in the United States knows that. Well, everybody in India, if you say, who was, how did Christianity get here? They say Thomas. But it's not just the Christians that say that. The Hindus who were there at the time, Hinduism was the dominant religion. When Christianity came, the Hindu writings speak about the growth of Christianity. They speak about a person who came to India, and I'm jumping ahead to next week's class, but that's okay. They speak about a person who came from the West, which would be Thomas coming from the Europe area, and traveled to them, somebody who spoke a different language, somebody who did miracles, uh, somebody who did healings, and somebody who brought this new religion of one God and one Savior. And the Hindu people could have said that never happened. They could have said that was all just made up. They said that they could have said he never appeared. He was never here. But there's no accounts of that because they all knew he was there and they all knew it was true. You could say the same thing as it's similar to when Jesus was, was dead, buried and resurrected in the early church. And they're preaching about a resurrected Christ. None of the Pharisees said, well, well, well stop. We know that didn't happen because they all know it did happen. None of the Pharisees st stopped and said, oh, no, no, that didn't, that's not true. He, he would never was killed. None of them said that because they all knew it was true. They tried to cover it. 
But they all, the same thing happened in India. The Hindu records talk about this preacher who came from the West, who was preaching about one true God and starting uh, new organizations, new, the Greek word is new ecclesias, new groups of people to do fellowship with the old record state. And it was Thomas. Yeah, please. The, the, uh, the history of the story of it, but they acknowledge that it was a historical fact, but that doesn't mean that they believed Thomas's message. Yeah. But they couldn't deny that it happened. Same thing about in the early church. The Pharisees and Sadducees couldn't deny that Jesus did these miracles, that he, that he rose from the dead, but they could deny it. They could try to cover it up, try to bribe the guards to say that the, the disciples had stolen the body, but they couldn't deny that it happened. So anyway, that's jumping ahead just a tiny bit. But that was fun. Okay. So here we have a map, and I'm kind of winding down for the class tonight, and then you have your quiz. This is about, this map is sort of accurate, but there's something missing that you should all know by now instantly. But the dark areas are areas where Christianity was really dominant. And so, okay, it makes sense that it would be this area here because of what? Who traveled there? Paul. And what New Testament epistles are from this area? Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Right, they're all from that area. You can see that very early on, Christianity is a strong presence in North Africa, a strong presence here in Egypt, and from accounts that we've read tonight and we'll read next week, down the Nile River to Ethiopia, which would be more down here. Other areas that are lighter colored, you can see how there was a Christian influence in these areas. Remember, who was the apostle that we said probably went to Spain and said he wanted to? Well, look what's here in Spain by the year 125, 150. There's a significant Christian presence there. How did it get there? Well, the, the Christians in Spain say it was from Paul. There's no evidence to refute that. Early church records say he did go there. But what's missing here? India. India? India, yeah. right. This map is incorrect because it should show the presence of Christianity here along the coast where Thomas preached. Uh, I have a map for next for, uh, for tomorrow night that shows, I think it says the year 200 or something, but it's very colored here, showing that Christian influence. So if I made this map, if I had these skills, which I don't, I would have put a lighter color along this west coast of India to show Thomas's influence. Okay, well, that basically concludes the class for tonight, but we have a quiz and I want to give a chance for questions. So questions, comments, anything for anyone? The black sea, uh -huh. casket sea. Right here. And this, yeah, thank you. Remember, what was the E word I said we were going to learn a lot about? Yes. Odessa. Well, guess where Odessa is? Right there. Is that Odessa today? No. Odessa and Odessa are not the same. Odessa is an O, Odessa is an E. The location is similar, but I, Odessa with an O today is a region. Odessa was a city. Now, I don't know specifically the geopolitical history, but probably there's a connection somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And so this is the this was the headquarters, Odessa. And what direction did the gospel go from there? And then what came in the late 500s, early 600s, and came through that area, Islam, and destroyed the records and the buildings. Okay. Uh, Will we ever get any of these maps or notes, uh, like online or handouts? I'm happy to, at the end of the class, pull together the PowerPoint, and I, yeah, I can email it to you. That's a, you know, if you're able to sign up through the form, then I have your email. So it's things like that that help me so that I can contact you. So, um, yeah, I'm happy to, happy to send it to you at the end of the class. Please. I should not have my head again, but. Here, there was a scripture that said, uh, Paul said that, second, he said that this generation shall not pass. One, and then 
and that uh, say that this uh, the, the word shall preach all the nations. Then in uh, Acts chapter four says that said that um, we should go everywhere to share the gospel. Right. We didn't be this treated. Why don't we just say that the apostle had a different life? We didn't want to bring God Jesus back in the second coming, or did he just go by that? That was, I think, three questions. <laughs> I already forgot the first two. <laughs> so give me the first one again. Right. So there's three states, right? Uh -huh. uh, where it says the generation shall not pass right. before the second coming of Jesus. Okay, stop. After that text, which is in Matthew, and it may be in Mark 2, maybe, but I know it's in Matthew. After that text, it's explained that Jesus is, was Peter and James and John, I think, were brought up to a Mount of Transfiguration and they saw the glory of Jesus and, and all of his holiness and a vision. And a lot of people believe that when it said that this generation shall not, remind me of the, I, I'm thinking of three questions again. What was it again? Yeah, this generation shall not pass until the son of man comes in his glory or something like that. A lot of people say that, well, that was fulfilled right there at that moment because those apostles saw Jesus in all his glory and all his majesty and that vision at that time. And so that's that's a simple way to say, well, how could how could all these things happen? The apostles died 2,000 years ago. Jesus hasn't come back, but he did come and showed at that moment his glory to those people. That's how I've understood that text. And um, if you don't agree with me, We'll talk about it later. But what was your second question? You don't remember either, right? command the commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every preacher from Matthew 28 has never expired no. and uh, so we still use that as motivation to do missions we still use that as a as a incentive to yeah. go out and preach and teach and share on the street whether it's on the street corner here yeah. uh, or whether it's on the other side of the world that's our motivation and we still have those marching orders I just want to say that there's a, there's a guy that did 600 the part of the alliance so he, he, he believed that by reaching all nations uh -huh. the gospel to all nations, he actually made the Jesus. Oh, okay. That's post, oh, the post millennialism maybe? Or, um, that, that is uh, an idea that has come and gone throughout church history mm -hmm. that is when the time comes that the gospel has reached every nation and every part of the world, then Jesus will return at that point. Okay, that's one way to look at the future. Another way to look at the future, it's called eschatology, the study of the future, it's a big word, but the study of future things. Another way to look at that is not that the world is gonna get better and we're gonna keep reaching people and then finally Jesus is gonna come. Another way is just the opposite, that the world's getting worse and worse and that Jesus is gonna come and pull his people out and then the judgments will come on the world. That's it. So there's two basic ways to look at history, the doctrinal statement of the church here and of the college here is the latter one that I was saying that things are getting worse and that Jesus is going to come and take his people pull them out. And then the cataclysmic events of revelation are going to happen, and then the people of God are going to come back on the earth and be part of the kingdom. That's a little bit more than what we're talking about in church history, but the fact that you mentioned that is, is a, an example of how throughout church history, these good ideas are being shared and people are struggling with these things even today. There are people that are wrestling with, you know, am I waiting for, to, one way to put it is, am I waiting for the Christ or am I waiting for the Antichrist? Who am I waiting for? Am I waiting for things to get better or things to get worse? And, and that's still an issue today. Um, so, uh, yeah, also, you know, you're using up a lot of my time. Then I can just promise. The apples all here, they were just told by the great calling that Jesus said. Them. Yes, right. They heard him say it and they responded. Spent their lives even to death to serve. 
<laughs> okay. Anyone else? Okay. Here's your three questions for your quiz. I hope you have a piece of paper because you have to uh, answer these questions. Put your name on the paper and um, write down answers to these three things. This is your quiz. And when you finish, uh, Dr. Arnold, if you agree, when they finish, they can just leave. Do you have any final issues, concerns for the class? Okay, see you tomorrow night at seven. But uh, it should take you about 10. I tried to give you like 10 minutes or so. So we'll end right around nine. But um, this is a quiz. Anybody need paper or are you all good? Yes. Okay. And an extra piece of paper, anyone that can give? What's the middle? Thank you. You need something to write with? Okay. Anyone need something to write with? Okay. You can tell I'm low tech. Dr. Arnold would do it. He'd have you all do it on your laptops and email him. But I'm I'm a low tech guy, so <laughs> I'm still learning all this stuff. But here's your three questions. I'll be quiet. And um, this is your final quiz. When you're finished, you're welcome to leave. I enjoyed having you all. Thanks. See you tomorrow night at seven. Hope you all come back. <laughs>